I wanted you to read Kalko Z for today, um, and the, the title that I'm uh, giving this particular chapter of the ongoing epic is Twisting a Trope. Um, it's a title that I enjoy because trope means twisting anyway, is turning. And uh, today is the day when I want to try and make good a little bit on my boast, remember, remember my t-shirt motto, uh, tropes are instrumental, not ornamental. Uh, I want to try and largely demonstrate that at the pearl, particularly of the trope of apostrophe, uh, but also of puns. Uh, but I should say just a word or two about, uh, you know, my theory is that uh, tropes are the vehicle through which generic appropriations take place. I should say a quick word about what I see as being the generic appropriations that happen in capital V quite obviously it as declares itself to be a, a shipboard log, a car a a leaf of the bar, a car de bar. Uh, a journal de bar, sorry. Um, which turns into uh, something that I would call an autothanatography. Um, uh, obviously doing a little bit of uh, Greek third invention on the basis of an autobiography. Autothanatography is a story of your own death. And the other, um, uh, so that uh, the account of the, of a material voyage becomes uh, the account of a uh, rather more um, mystical, sacred, symbolic uh, voyage, which is uh, an encounter with wonder, you know, the enormous says, and death. Um, and then the other generic um, transformation that's working here is um, between the love letter uh, referred to uh, uh, as the letters that Agnes Pascal, who wrote to his lover E, to which E never responded to, which uh, gets transformed into Cargo V as what he calls in Lettre d'Amour Jim. Lettre d'Amour is in Lettre d'Amour Jim as one of the Here. And you can think of uh, a letter that will do to as being one of the possible ways you might want to define witnessing as a practice. Uh, get through to people, get a response out of um, people who don't respond to your love letters uh, by uh, transmogrifying them. But, um, as I promised last week, I want to begin with Baudelaire, and, uh, and if we get to the end, I'll, I'll end with Baudelaire too. Um, I'm planning, I, uh, in order to go to a conference uh, next uh, October, I've already offered them a paper that's called AIDS in the 19th Century, um, and so I'm trying this out on you <laughs> uh, to see how it flies. Uh, uh, but I, did, I did want to talk about Baudelaire because he is one of the central figures in the, in the text, I think, uh, along with a number of other 19th century writers like Coleridge and Nietzsche and musicians, uh, the Beethoven of the Fifth Symphony, right, and rapping at the door, uh, destiny knocking at the door, symphony, uh, the Wagner of Goethe de Mohun, Crépuscule uh, Flamboyant, as he refers to it, and uh, Saint-Saëns, slightly unexpected third musician, but uh, uh, Saint-Saëns wrote quite a lot of sacred music, including an organ symphony, which is what I'm doing is raising the issue of the flow of human syndrome um, again uh, today and, um, and, and dis trying to discuss it in relation to what's clearly going on in the cargo view, which is a kind of sublimation of the, of the horrible aspects of, the, of the, it's turning it into um, an occasion for wonderment in our view. So let's start with Bill there. And I want to start more particularly with the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. Uh, 
and I were just discussing uh, the relativity of, of weather. He was saying it's quite a nice day today, and I was saying it depends what you compare it with. Uh, because I had in mind Mauritius and the green uh, mice <laughs> in the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, which was known to the Portuguese uh, mariners who discovered it as the Island of the Swan. And it was called the Island of the Swan because the Mauritius was the home of a number of um, species that didn't exist elsewhere, but in particular of a, of a land bird called the dodo. Now famous in the proverb, that is a dodo. It was a clumsy bird, and its consequence it just didn't resist being hunted uh, as soon as the people, you know, human beings arrived on their own, they hunted the dodo for its protein, and it's now extinct. It was already extinct when uh, Baudelaire uh, arrived in Mauritius in 1841. Um, but to call a dodo a swan, is a catacrisis. And it's also an you know, early example of the floaty mild syndrome, I would say, right? You don't have a suitably clumsy word for the letter, except Dodo, which has been invented to. Um, the Portuguese therefore called it the swan as being the worst word that they could get, thereby ennobling the Dodo. The world once had lots of land. Uh, uh, land birds, and we're now down to the Indian ostrich, I think it's about it, the moa was uh, hunted to extinction by the Maori in the museum, where they were poor, the poor for it. Uh, Baudelaire was in Mauritius in 1841, and he went on to La Réunion. Then he, and he came back to Paris from that voyage to the tropics with a new kind of poetics. He was very young, he was just 20 at the time, 20, 21. Uh, but it was the making of Baudelaire. It was the voyage that gave him a, a new kind of lush poetics of the exotic, which became part of the ideal part of the stream and ideal um, dichotomy that governs a lot of the poetic uh, mode. So it's an idealization that's, that's going on in that, in that kind of writing. He also returned with an interesting birds. This is what I'm um, particularly birds when they display a certain relation of the ungainly and the graceful. Uh, birds that are uh, graceful in the air, but ungainly on land, like the albatross. I'm sure everybody here has been taught the albatross, poem number two uh, in North uh, Wales, yes, uh, about the graceful bird which, when it's captured by the sailors, becomes. Uh, and then the object of mockery says ever does he all not patient enough. Uh, but he also after the albatross seems to have been written in at least its first form soon after he returned, so probably in eighteen forty two sometime. In eighteen fifty nine um, he was still thinking about the swans. And uh, so you have the great poem modernity called the scene. Which uh, would take uh, three or four hours to do justice to, but it's centered on uh, an urban site, something that's like seen in the city. A swan escaped from a bird market uh, in, a, in a dusty gutter, a long way from its uh, maybe lake, its burlap in town, and described in the poem as Connery's exile, grotesque sublime, like exiles. Grotesque and sublime. And the poem is dedicated to Victor Hugo, who's a famous exile of the period, um, who is therefore grotesque as you do, right? It's also described as being simultaneously um, uncouth, if you like, and vain, uh, and sublime. Uh, the reference being to that voice coming from the edge, the voice from Guernsey, uh, as something like the conscience, Francis conscience, for a good 20 years, uh, there was this message coming. There we go. Um, Baudelaire is also, a couple of other poems, but that wasn't uh, uh, um, present, uh, at least surreptitiously or subterranean and in Cardinal V. One poem is uh, mentioned specifically, and that is La Mélamea, uh, 
Well, the early poem, well, there's probably dating from the early 1950s. Uh, and uh, Pascal Le Duc just cites the first line of the livre, Toujours tu cherchas un man. Free man, you will always cherish the sea. And he lets the rest of the poem resonate in the, re resonate in the memory. Uh, I made a copy of it because I won't be able to talk about it. Uh, I think there's a, you know, partly something of a kind of test going on when I was a reader, uh, because there are interesting ways in which that poem, the thematics of that poem resonate with the thematics of Calgary, but I don't want to go into them here and now. Some other time, maybe, when I do my big essay on AIDS in the 19th century, maybe I'll write more of that. I mean, uh, love me. But the other two poems that are resonating here by Baudelaire are uh, the first poem of the, the liminal poem, poem at the one edge of the Fleur du Mar, which is a poor lecteur, the address to the reader, in the poem with its very famous last line, uh, hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable mon frère, uh, so hypocritical reader, my, uh, and my uh, brother. Uh, <laughs> and the last poem, in, both, in all of the editions, of the Fleur du Mar published in Baudelaire's life, and Le Voyage, uh, The Voyage, which has another famous last line, the well, last line of a bit, plongé, plongé, au fond du gouffre, pour trouver de l'inconnu. Plunge to the depths of the abyss in order to discover the unknown. It very clearly resonates with and that's the other liminal, uh, it's at the other edge of the flow of the which can end the liminal, uh, uh, which, which vibrates very uh, interestingly, obviously. Uh, so all those poems are relevant to uh, Calvary V, uh, to its travel thematic, to its rhetoric, and in particular to its problematic of the sublime and the Now, uh, so why am I talking about all this stuff? I'm gradually working towards why I'm talking about all this stuff. Um, I think that there is a subterranean pun uh, working in uh, Calgary. It's subterranean because you have to guess that it's there. Um, it's a hypothetical pun, if you like. Not very critical, but hypothetical. Uh, and here it is. In 1492, um, a gentleman by the name of Cristoforo Colombo uh, set out from Cardiff in Spain, uh, sailing west in hopes of reaching the east. He wanted to prove that you can reach the east by sailing west. And he returned with news of a fabulous new world, which he was inclined to think was cafe, but he wasn't too sure. Um, and he also brought back syphilis which then spread which, like a rapid epidemic right through Europe and actually reached Japan in the next to no time. Uh, so his, some historians, like other historians will say, he took syphilis with him to America, where it ravaged the uh, local populations, so of course. By the way, you have a history of epidemic associated with uh, backwards and forwards across the Atlantic uh, voyage and this interesting attempt to um, join the extremes, so to speak. 1992, exactly 500 years later, Pascal de Duve set out. His age was already very advanced. Um, he declared itself symptomatically until it was already advanced, quite, quite unusually. And the reason was uh, that the virus had uh, reached his brain and uh, was actually the virus itself, HIV, this was not an opportunistic disease, uh, but the, the effect of the, of the HIV virus itself um, was uh, gradually destroying his grey matter. <laughs> no. So in that condition, he left Le Havre on a round-trip uh, voyage to the French West Indies, uh, Fort de France in Martinique, and pont a pitre in Guadeloupe, and back bringing with him the log book, his book, um, in which he describes the wonderment of a new vision of life, a uh, new vision of the world provided him uh, 
by the action of the virus on his body, in part, and in part by the proximity of death, by the heightening of sensation uh, that uh, treats as being a key to the experience of the sacred and all experience of the sublime. So both travellers came and went and they brought a message back of renewal of some kind. Now you're saying that's a pun. <laughs> this sounds more like a completely arbitrary talk to me. And of course, as I've said before, that's what they pay me for. Uh, but it happens that Cristoforo Colombo and Pascal de Duve both have the name of a bird. Um, Colombo is a pigeon, of course. A Duve uh, is most probably. Um, Pascal de Duve was a Belgian and he lived in Antwerp, so he was French speaking Belgian, he lived in the Dutch speaking, the Dutch speaking part of Belgium, or pretty much the center of the South Point. Uh, in Dutch, Louf means the Dutch. Right? And the de in Pascal de Duve's name is therefore a definite article, a part of it, like the man, so the man is the man. Right? Similarly, this is Pascal de Duve. Okay? Um, so the pun is on one bird, the pigeon, generally regarded as a kind of form of vermin, like mice and rats, kind of morphological equivalent of rice and mat, mice and rats, rice and mat. Um, the other, the dove, the epitome of grace, the messenger of the divine, and so on, in Italian, a language that I like for various reasons, um, but in particular for this reason, the proximity of those two birds is very frankly acknowledged. Uh, in Colombo is a pigeon, in a Colomba is a dove, right? Whereas, you know, other more squeamish languages try to keep them separate, uh, Italian recognizes that there's close proximity uh, 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 between those two uh, kinds of birds. So there's your pun, uh, right? I call it to be a hypothetical pun. Right? I've read the, the book many times and haven't found anything that I can claim to be an explicit Columbus uh, uh, reference. And that's what's interesting about this pun, I think. If it is a pun at all. And that's the other thing that's interesting about it is that I don't know whether it's there or not. Right? Keeps me awake at night. It's alright. Oh, okay, uh, so we talked about Baudelaire, and then we talked about the Voyager pun. Uh, last point before I get started. Um, the two most striking rhetorical features of Calgary are, um, on the one hand, its deployment of puns. That's to say, in more general terms, the uh, figure of Peronomancia, which is, you know, basically, it, ex any exploitation of resemblances, accidental resemblances between words, um, so puns, and the other feature is the abundance of apostrophe. Uh, I don't need to write up apostrophe, do I? Um, what I want to suggest is, first of all, that um, apostrophe has a rhetorical structure that's figured by the round trip voyage. In apostrophe, you turn away, you know, as I might say, you know, talking to you people, I might suddenly turn around and say, Mother dear, I know you're there, um, but please stop. You know what mother is up to at the moment. I dedicate this example to you, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> mother dear, I know you're there, I know you're concerned about my performance. It'll be okay, stop worrying. Right? So that's a form of a question. I turn away from you. The message is nevertheless directed to the audience. Right? The message of the turning away is directed to you. And the message that is part of it, otherwise it would be a figure of the um, So it's a turning away, or it's, it's a trope that twists back on itself. It's a turning away that turns back, if you like, right? a little bit like a round trip bridge. Second uh, thing that I want to suggest about the rhetorical texture of the thing is that um, paranomasia being a um, a valorization of what you might call parasitical elements in language. Uh, elements that are there, like resemblances between words, but that don't count for, for the purposes of 
of ordinary communication. Uh, they get disregarded in normal uh, communication. There, but they would get in the way if you were all the time aware of that stuff going on, of all the possible puns that are available at any given moment in anybody's speech, there wouldn't be any communication. So we disregard those possibilities in order to make communication happen. So the, the virtuality of puns functions like parasites uh, in the language, and like parasites particularly in the French sense of the, of the word parasite, where parasit is used for what we would call static or noise in you know, communication. Uh, so it's the, uh, the technical term noise, technical term of information to noise in the channel, is translated parasit. So I want to say then that uh, punning is um, uh, figuratively, metaphorically, has the status of a kind of virus in the linguistic um, bloodstream, of which users of language are normally unconscious. So they're like, um, I'm thinking obviously of the analogy of seropositivity, uh, which uh, you can be completely unaware of unless it gets into the proper test, but uh, you can cannot know that you're seropositive very while the virus is operating nevertheless. The virus multiplying in the linguistic bloodstream, right? um, and, and that is the analogy that's operating, I think, in the case of Pascal to do uh, clear delight in no community. So, like stuttering and stammering, hunting functions as if it was noise in the channel of communication. And in that sense, it's a figure of death, it's the death of communication, it's the death of writing. As a ordinary act of communication, and it turns it into something else. Uh, so it's a, a figure for the presence of death in life. But also, um, uh, punning language as virally infected language, uh, a langage parasite, you might want to say in French, uh, is capable of infiltrating culture, of infecting culture, and taking epidemic precautions um, as a kind of imaginary of Carl uh, going on in the writing, such that Pascal um, Duvis is asking himself, how can I wake people up? How can I get people to realize that the culture is zero, zero possible? And his answer is, well, this language is the way to go to do that. And so we have another example in our series of metaphors of inf cultural infiltration, of, of witnessing as a form of infiltration of culture, uh, with however a, a slight difference, but in this case there's the threat of an epidemic, right? Um, uh, if, if, uh, if a virally infected language. So point, the rhetorical point one, the round trip voyage is the figure for uh, apostrophe and vice versa. Point number two, punning is the figure for viral infection of language. Point number three, um, still, still on the question of rhetoric, what uh, paranomasia and um, apostrophe have in common, and more particularly what punning and apostrophe have in common, is that they're both equivocal figures equivocal tropes. Um, apostrophe is equivocal with respect to who is being addressed. Right? Mother, go away. Right? Who's receiving that message? I doubt if my mother is receiving it. Right? If there is a message there, you are the people who are receiving it. But it's, it's not clear, right? Not obvious on the, on, the, on the face of it. So apostrophe is equivocal as to its address. The cunning is the very figure of equivocation because it's an actualization of double meaning. Right? Things are happening at the same time and you are not asked to choose between them. In fact, you don't get the point if you don't choose between them. Both of them have to be uh, equally operating. Uh, but equivocation is kind of an equivocation in the whole idea of equivocation. Yeah, I don't get too complicated and that I am here, but uh, uh, in French, uh, in équivoque, 
doesn't, uh, doesn't translate punning, uh, or it might translate punning, but it doesn't necessarily translate punning. Uh, if you don't translate the English phrase, double entendre. <laughs> right? An ekibop is a double entendre. That is to say, the pun is not actualized in the, in the language, but there is a suggestion is made that res decent, respectable, and even sublime language may have concealed in it a reference to something obscene, something ugly, something that you don't want to hear about. So, so, uh, so equivocation can take both of, both of those forms. It can be uh, a punning where both meanings are present, are actualized, or it can be a double entendre where one meaning is left to be suggested the best at. With me? Yeah? Okay. Now, as you know, I think equivocation is probably the key figure of uh, much of it, if not uh, all of it. Um, and uh, so essentially, um, what I want to talk about then is the way equivocation works here through apostrophe and through honey in this. Now, it's not an easy thing to do. It's very complicated and sort of fiddly. Uh, so I wish us all good luck. In this, uh, in this, uh, but think of the pigeon and the dove, right? Uh, is there a pigeon concealed in every dove? Is the kind of question that we might ask. Um, yeah. Concealed in every dove, but also revealed by every, every dove. Is it possible that the only way you can really get out the, the, the essence of the obscene and talk about the reality of the pigeon is by interesting people in the dove, doveliness of the world. Any applause or contributions, questions, expressions of skepticism? I'm also contains the possibility of the dove containing a pigeon. In other words, mm -hmm. you have uh, something sublime, but it's, uh, you know, it's Condition of the other, it's, yeah. that, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the condition itself that creates these new perceptions, there's, there's these new visions, and, and they only come about because of uh, because of the book. I think we can all go home now, really. Uh, that's kind of the, the central point that I wanted to get at. <laughs> um, the, the reason I want to get at it, though, is that the book is not normally read in that way. The book is read as an idea, and often criticized as being an idealization. You can't do anything but idealize in this sense. This is an exaggeration of that consistency, which makes it um, fairly clearly And the dove, <laughs> going, the dove going to get the message to bring back, but yeah. you never know. There's no limits to critical ingenuity. No. Uh, you can get things. Yeah, in fact, that's, that's right. We have a whole dissertation. You know, there are probably several dissertations in that fact. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the dove. Well, they're all, uh, not, not clear ones that I'm conscious of, and, but I would not say no, you know, I haven't proved a negative. Um, it's just that message of hope, business, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, from devastation and destruction. You know, if you're going to talk about this rapid voyage in the water, and just somehow, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, You also have to think of the, uh, uh, of the other, not, not exactly pun, but of the other resonance of the two first names, Christopher and his Christ bearer. Um, and Pascal refers to the lamb, right? And Pascal uh, lamb, that's to say the sacrifice. So, you know, there is a dissertation right there, I swear to you. There is a dissertation right there. Second dissertation, on each. Okay. Let me um, get... <laughs> I'm sorry. Is it my generosity? That's, uh... <laughs> I'm always pleased to give somebody else work to do. Uh... Um, okay. Uh, now I'm going to talk about apostrophe for a bit. 
and uh, then I'll talk about writing for a bit, and then I'll be back at the end. So then I'll talk about reading, and that'll bring me back to uh, Claude Lair. We may or may not get through all of that um, stuff, but I think you've got the sort of general gist of my argument um, right now, and the rest will all be icing on the cake, or alternatively, Dross, with the dross that's left over after you've panned for gold, you know. Let's see how we go. Uh, okay, apostrophe. Now, uh, I've you know, already described what I see as being the dynamics of, of apostrophe. It's a device for getting attention, uh, of course, and that is to say for getting authority if you discourse. But it's like a perverse one, it kind of twists and turns, that right? puts perverse. Um, in that um, the speaker turns away to address someone or something that normally um, is beyond the reach of normal communication. In apostrophe, it's always gods, or spirits, or the dead, or animals, or something other like that. And that turning away message is nevertheless directed at an audience that has to judge the significance of the turning away. Uh, to put it more technically, that there's a turning away in the NRC, um, but a turning back in the NRC are so, um, The turning away is part of the... Are those terms okay for everybody? Uh, they come from the linguistics of the person called uh, English. Translated roughly with paper and without this, with general theories, you don't get the one without the other, because there's no statement that is not also an utterance, and no utterance that doesn't make the same kind of containing statement. And so if you can say that a statement uh, has a subject and an address C, um, mother, dropping theory, uh, I am speaking to my mother, the address C of my speech is I. Whereas the utterance um, has another subject and, and another uh, receiver, right? I'm sort of distinguishing between addressor, addressee, sender, receiver here, right? If the addressor, addressee is a turning away, the receiver, uh, the, the sender, receiver relationship is a turning back uh, to the original uh, audience, okay? Now, it's more, those terms are more complicated than that, but that will do for for now, I just wanted to sort of lay out for you analytically how this thing um, works. And as I've also suggested, that dynamics is enacted in narrative terms in the voyage out and the voyage back um, of um, uh, Calgary, which we can also map in terms of the main addressees of the apostrophes. There are any number, I have to count how many apostrophes there are in, in this text, but there are any number of them. It's a real you know, tick of style. Uh, but the main ones are E, the lover who dumped uh, Pascal uh, when he became St. Mary. Um, and who's um, and who's therefore figures in the text as the site of denial of eight, right, that's what he means, uh, including his own zero positivity. He, he was HIV positive, didn't want to know about it, didn't want to be reminded about it, in particular by Pascal being sick, so, uh, so a figure of denial. The next main addressee of the pastor is AIDS itself, CIDA in French, uh, frequently addressed as CIDA mon amour. So that there is a displacement and an intensification of Pascal's love for E uh, in this new love, love on the rebound, you might say, right, for uh, for age. So E is the person from whom the turning of the voyage takes place. Age is the figure. To, towards whom the turning of the voyage is uh, directed. And then you have one single apostrophe right at the end. Cher et surtout très hypothétique lecteur, it says, right? 
dear and above all extremely hypothetical reader uh, we'll read that passage this time in a minute. so the reader is the figure back to whom Pascal returns at the end so we can uh, map it on the east west business see back in Europe turning away from me turning away from me I don't know how you mark turning away <laughs> Okay, this way, right? Turning away from E, towards, turning towards um, A, right? Turning back to reader. Got me? Good, I'm getting that, yeah? And what's interesting is there's this gap between E and reader. There's a difference between the figure of E and the figure of the uh, reader, which is the sign of the transformation that the text wants to produce. Right? It doesn't want to turn E into reader. E is, e is no longer accessible. E, e is not answering any messages at all. Right? But it wants to find uh, uh, a reader who would be the equivalent of E, but the equivalent of E rendered responsive to the message. And the way of doing that is that you have to travel uh, west in order to get back east. Right? Am I making sense at all? We're driving you crazy for both. Okay. <clears throat> so let's run through them uh, really quickly. Uh, the first series of apostrophes are those addressed to E. And what they do is announce quite specifically that E is turning away from... Um, uh, that uh, Pascal is turning away from E. Uh, I'll just read you one because it's uh, important. Um, J'ai emporté avec moi, Tévisson, page 35, pour le follow, avec moi, tout, avec moi tes lettres, toutes tes lettres, une photo aussi débordante d'une beauté des fins. Leur bière est une boîte à chaussures en carton, scellée par une corde solide, ok, c'est de la vie, scellée par une corde solide qui entoure ce petit cercle et qui se termine sur le couvercle qui te sert <coughs> par des nœuds faits pas fait pour ne jamais être défaits, contrairement aux nœuds pas Au cœur d'une nuit prochaine, M. Vecteur, je me lui suis fait toujours, il plans to have a, to hold a burial at sea. His, his head is in a coffin, with a cardboard box coffin. He's going to hold a burial at sea. Une nuit prochaine, donc, ma cabine cesserait d'être leur morgue, et je procéderai à cet emmerdement rituel. Pan, right, not an enterrement. It's an emmerdement, it's in the sea. It's written in the ERE, right, as if it was a mère or mother. And it very clearly, well, to my mind, to my perverse mind, clearly covers for another possible uh, word. Yeah, right, that's what I think, you know. Um, it's an omnivore of a trip, say, by burying your sea, the right? Um, Again, may or may not be there. I think the spelling in the RE instead of in the R is part of the technique to sort of cover, to cover up the possibility of to divert attention away from that other possible uh, pun okay. To those of us who are Mo Tourney ourselves, um, no less we Mo Tourney, it's um, hard to escape. So E then is a figure for a whole society that's in denial. Okay. The society uh, mentioned page 33. It's got this imagining of humanity as being uh, uh, a bunch of cows uh, set about a field by a, by a uh, mysterious god. There they are <coughs> standing around, okay, in the field. Most go on placidly chewing their cuts without asking themselves to them. That's what he is all about. He, he is the guy who wants to be able to go on, basically, stop chewing. Um, whereas, uh, 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 and so the 
reality here, uh, or that cut through in the society, uh, is the passengers on the other passengers on the ship who similarly don't know and are completely oblivious to the possibility that there is a kind of viral stowaway among them in the person of Pascal um, himself. The Carl V has a more complex load, a more complex charge, a more complex cargo than, um, than these complacent people Im imagine. Um, so Eric, right, I, I call him Eric because that seems to be the most likely name. He then um, described, okay, page 25, tu faisais comme si le site n'existait pas, le sujet est tabou, right? The act of as if AIDS didn't exist, so we have to be. Uh, Eric then stands for the passengers, stands for uh, a complacent uh, and unconscious um, society that is nevertheless infected. Right? The viral presence is nevertheless uh, there. So we have a sort of ship of fools, um, thematic, the ancient um, motif of the Malin ship. The ship of fools. Um, there, uh, most of the passengers on the ship are simply unaware, unaware of the kind of reality. Okay, the second set of apostrophes, then, are the apostrophes to AIDS, which is addressed lovingly uh, and always favorably compared to uh, Pascal's relation with E. E, who dumped Pascal. Age is always described as being something that you can count on. It will always be there. It's not going to dump me, and I'd prefer it for that reason. It's an element of stability in the life. So these uh, addresses to age are always full of insinuations and little barbs. Um, age 13, uh, minuscule petite bestiole. It says, um, Ligue par million. Vous occupez mon cerveau et vous vous en occupez. You're occupying my brain. And you're looking after it. You're taking care of it. I'm like, mais avec le bon Plus, there's more fun boys. In this case, a little bit uh, later. Page um, 31. Cher, très cher, Deliash, voilà encore que tu m'en fièvres comme seul toi peux le faire de cette éclat qui s'allait au froid. Comparison of the fever uh, of uh, right, um, with respect to the other you know, feverish love affair. Uh, think of that. Uh, this one is unique comme seul toi peux le faire. Um, perhaps the best one, uh, best ones in this nasty vein. Uh, on page um, 84. Si dans mon cœur de bord, si dans mon calvaire, si dans mon amour, j'entretiens avec toi une relation passionnelle que je n'envisage pas. I have no intention of running away from this particular relationship. Look at earlier. Si dans mon amour, toi au moins, tu me resteras fidèle jusqu'à la mort. You will be faithful to me. So, uh, insinuations and barbs, but also, uh, the love affair with AIDS is never less in continuity with the love affair with which is described in terms of a sacralization. Um, it's in particular to Mozart's Requiem playing uh, while, the, while the lovemaking was going on, sacralizing the love. Right? Now that sacralization applies to the relationship um, with AIDS and in intensified um, form because AIDS is understood as an escape from complacency, as an escape from everyday unconsciousness. It's the source of enalignement, uh, of wonderment, through the intensification of uh, life experience. Um, this is not an apostrophe, but I read it because it's um, characteristic. Well, it's actually, well, it actually is an apostrophe, but it's an apostrophe addressed to PWAs, people with age. Ouvrez les yeux pour vous émerveiller les grandes choses et surtout les petites. Toutes celles dont ce que la mort ne focus pas encore, ceux pour qui la mort est lointaine et abstraite, ne peuvent véritablement jouir comme nous pouvons. Open your eyes to see the kinds of things that people who are not 
in proximity in this space. Don't have to learn to. And then it goes off the end between the workers of the world, right? Workers of the world unite. Uh, PWA is of the world. The reason we need to do is, and that's like our problem on the Peru, let's get drunk on that privilege. For the real combat of success, good, you know what, you know what, you know the better to combat our suffering, that I do not wish to minimize. Okay, so uh, the first point about the relation to age, it is kind of a replica, but more so, of the uh, so, equivocation there, a form of equivocation between the two other things. Unlike Malami, Malami's practice was to let language work on its own and for the poet to disappear. Uh, poetry is not a Spanish law, to work it well, to poet, right? so as to allow the resources of language to develop. That's not the style. That's how it is, pure thing. The writer still has an identity, but the writer is collaborating with death. Right? La mort qui fait son œuvre en moi, he says, right? Death is, is creating its work in me through the vehicle of, of the virus, the vehicle of age. I am writing that work of death, right? So the key uh, apostrophe here would be the one on page 13 where he says, VH, c'est un peu toi qui écris uh, HIV, you're pretty much the one doing the writing here, okay? And my point about that apostrophe would be, well, I made several points, one point is that it's obviously, you know, motivated by uh, the exact form that age was taking in the past one of these case, that's to say the invasion of his brain by the virus, right? So there's a literal sense, which is, as it was almost literal sense, which is, I would say, very asked to think what we can receive. Uh, secondly, though, that apostrophe itself enacts a collaboration because it's saying, uh, because it's enoncé, because in the enoncé, the, a writing subject is attributing the possibility of writing to age, right? Whereas the subject of the enunciation is a writing subject. So, there are certain that what you can see, somebody is writing that apostrophe which attributes the power of writing to it. Consequently, the writing is a collaboration. With me there? And then the third major point that I've made about that question is that it bears the very sign of equivocation 
Then he asked, he said, can you do it? And he said, he was speaking French, and they're in an argument, and he wanted to sort of read the way out of it by agreeing with both sides of the argument the way one does. Right? Well, I'm not supposed to have good rhetoric, but in fact, the fact that the only way to negotiate the position. Then, un peu, he's a gap to the table. He's having un peu, he's not. Right? You know, uh, 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 it's a very, very handy uh, term used in French as the marker of the position. You can also take it as distributing. They ask, c'est un peu toi, et un peu moi. Right? Keep it to the interesting but the third element of writing is identity forming uh, for the writer uh, collaborative with their and there's a lot more stuff there that you can find for yourself uh, but the third element is he says uh, this is in response to uh, you ask again uh, she says écrire c'est un peu uh, I've got a on the brain now. Écrire, c'est uh, n'être personne. He says, je ne suis évidemment pas d'accord. Hein? On écrit pour se révéler à soi-même et aux autres. So, self-revelatory is the third point. And therefore, revelatory to oneself and to others. Okay. Now, that's kind of a bombshell in the text because uh, he is the secret age person on the ship. He's the passenger uh, from the stand, the stowaway uh, on the ship. Nobody knows. So the fact that he's writing is the, the, the fact that he's referring to writing as self revelatory represents the turning point here. Coming back to reveal yourself to somebody or other, which is both the turning point in the voyage and the turning point of the positive, because you're heading now towards that final possibility and the process of revelation uh, is figured in the moments in the narrative first of all uh, just before the arrival in um, Martinique when he writes a letter to Nicole that's going to be singled out among the passengers as being only, the only one word D, he says, to receive his secret. Um, it's still kind of a clandestine uh, letter. He uh, uh, writes it, puts it in a double envelope, writes on front of it, uh, not to be opened on the voyage, you know, um, only, to open, only to be opened when you're on the plane on your way to Venezuela, when you get off the ship, right, and gives it to her. But its contents reproduce the contents of the of, uh, it's, it's kind of a mise en abîme of Calvin D, which he now gives to the uh, public. And uh, not coincidentally, at lunch that day, the fellow passengers all make fun of him because he's got his sunburn from his face is just here. And um, there's. Uh, they don't realize is that my heart is peeling too. Okay. So the self-revelation is readable in his face. Okay. They don't understand, but they are nevertheless re revealing that he's coming out uh, from the secrecy of being a uh, But it's going to be a two-stage process. The face has come out to the column. Now mon cœur has to come out too. And that takes place here on the morning of the day of the arrival back in the This time, he makes that uh, funny little erotically charged um, visit to the uh, ship's, um, uh, what is it, um, uh, radio uh, Sparks, uh, whom he's already noticed at the very start of the voyage and had an erotic dream about. Mm -hmm. So something is returning now, and what's returning is love for a human being. Uh, but. Uh, We can write Sparks in here as being already a sort of figure for the for the reader that's going to be addressed in the you know, on, 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 back on the same page. Uh, and notice that Sparks is therefore yet another avatar 
called E, if they left behind in a band in time, but an E transformed because he is responsible. Okay, that's the point. There's complicity between them. Uh, they fall into the two form immediately instead of the rule that she says, you know. And Pascal, who goes away, no sexual consummation, he goes away leaving a message in Morse. Again, that little kind of thing is being leaving a message in Morse that could easily be uh, a version of his declarations of love to age. To say, this is on page 160, tout au long de ce voyage ensemble, je t'ai beaucoup aimé parce que tu m'as beaucoup aimé. Um, he could easily have said that to age. But he's now saying it to, to a human person. Um, now that tiptoe away, the discreet departure is what he's playing all along because he says, I visit its part pour faire connaissance avec lui et lui faire mes So the message of love is the same thing now as a departure message. Leave taking. The leave taking is the message of love. Consequently, when he turns to the group, on that same page, 116, you have to understand that the reader is being addressed now um, as one assumed to be or hoped to be capable of responding with love to the One things that you've got to keep means, she has a crazy got to keep with her. I don't know if you exist. Sure. I think the other thing I think that the kid means is a transformed version of the Baudelaire and hypocrite lecteur mais semblable in the Instead of being a hypocrite reader, a sight of denial, right? reader, I want you to be a hypothetical reader, that's to say a reader who can entertain hypotheses, a reader who can understand that there are underlying hypo positions. Positions in your text, right? That's what a hypothesis is. It's an underlying proposition, if you like. And so Sherry Puttikita here is saying in code, not exactly Morse code, but saying in code, don't be the Baudelaire reader than Baudelaire so hated, right? Be the reader that I want to love, more so love than you fair. Such a reader is a reader who can read what is underlying. And you know, had there been time and world enough, at that point I'd have returned to the Baudelaire thing and said what it means to, to read the underlying message of a text like this is to understand that the sublimation of a idealization of that which is going on is um, a catechesis for the response for the horror, the suffering, the pain, the ugliness. Death, as well as the sin of the is being asked to, to be capable of doing the kind of reading that uh, realizes that catechesis and understands that if there is an albatross, there is also an unnamed bird. If there is a swan, there is also a dodo. Uh, if there is a dove, let's go to do, there is also a pigeon, it's also a Colombo. And the condition of the one, the condition of, uh, the one is the condition of the other. I'm in ways such that each um, implies the other. And then lastly, if we've been kind of well enough, I'd have taken you to what I think is the most um, obvious um, equivocation in the text, which is an equivocation about the vision um, It's on uh, page 17, quite early in the text, where he's discussing uh, the, uh, the way a uh, disease makes people's eyes look huge, enlarges the eyes, and suggesting that that enlargement of the eyes is uh, sign of visionary ability of, of, of 
the faculty of wonderment of the Merveille Moon, right? Uh, the Manali Barre, uh, well, I'll ask you the questions now, and then you can answer them in a minute. Um, two things being said here. One is, eyes remain the same size all, all everybody's life. Right, right through your life, your eyes are the same, the same size. Therefore, your eyes to be enlarged by disease isn't in an optical illusion. That's one thing to say. The other thing we claim is the enlargement of eyes is an indicator of vision and capacity and of the ability to, um, to, to experience in a very moment, right? So, la maladie pareille, illusion d'optique, grandir mes yeux, dans les quartiers, etc. En réalité, je pense que les yeux ne changent pas de taille au cours de la vie. Okay, so that sounds straightforward enough, right? But, then he goes on, si j'ai raison, malades amigris et nouveau-nés tout petits partagent ainsi cet étrange rayonnement Dieu semblant immense. Cet étrange rayonnement Dieu semblant immense. Aux deux extrémités de la vie, un même humain émerveillement. Aux deux extrémités de la vie, un même émerveillement. So then he goes on to argue that children and the dying they rise because they're capable of wonder. Yes. <laughs> right? Is it an optical illusion? Is he arguing that, that it's an optical illusion or is he arguing that big eyes are the, are, are the sign of the capacity to wonder? He's arguing them both. Right? Making them both stick. And the grounds on which he's arguing them, I think, the grounds that makes the equivocation causal is the word explanation or those experimented in Ali, because it's a pun. It means both ends of life, birth and death. But it also means occasions of extremity on this life. Occasions of pregnancy, such as mental illness. And it's saying that the real, what is real, that makes the equivocation possible is the experience of eternity. When you have the experience of eternity, the, the experience of going to the edge, of being on the edge, of being about to be over, then you are capable of it. And with the language of eternity, which is the is therefore a language that we need to read for the eternity of the that is its condition. Yeah. Um, so, um, getting back to uh, the address to the reader now, it's saying, uh, reader, I may be an email the yeast, as she says, but I'm really agnostic about the one that I think. I don't know whether it's real in any sense or whether it's an emotion. What I do know is that it is conditioned on the experience of eternity. So reader, in my text, in my wonderment text, look for the external. Let it I can be fast when I turn my mind to it. It's my mouth. Um, what? The thing about the um, Lord Nelson though, is this Baudelaire's problem in the middle of the 19th century, after speaking, that part, that middle third of the 19th century, was how to take the ugliness of modern life and turn it into the beauty of The witnessing problem, as, as it's often discussed, is how to use inherited literary language, the flowers of rhetoric, in such a way that they can bespeak obscene realities and with which they are in, uh, in absolute contrast. Um, the kind of answer that Du is um, suggesting um, is um, that that's hardly the point in a way. What he's suggesting um, is that um, 
the situation is such that there is no form of beautiful language, like Swan and Madota, there is no form of beautiful language that does not refer to an ugliness, that is not conditioned on that ugliness. And similarly, there is no ugliness that does not have a beautiful expression. So the two go together in that suggestion. But it's up to loving reading, loving readership, to um, be able to understand that. And, and in the end, what in the other more probably means is the ability to understand that. Um, so, so the answer to the syndrome then, to the problem of the syndrome, is another form of equivocation. We don't put the one without the other. Therefore, when I say the one, I say the other. And I developed all that in response to a friend of mine who said, I hate how to read because the guy doesn't seem to be aware how horrible uh, it is. I was inclined to agree. Still, I'm a bit inclined to agree. Comments? I asked you to digest a lot in a rather short space uh, there, uh, which I apologize. Next day, um, I, I want to work a transition. Um, to the theme of haunting, or the metaphor of haunting, we've talked about infiltration of culture, we've talked about um, infecting culture with a virus. Uh, now I want to move to the sense in which uh, witness in writing understands itself metaphorically as a haunting of culture, standing on the edge of culture and just haunting it. Uh, I want to move uh, in that direction and, and, and that will be the theme of the seminars on the two films, Harry's um, uh, and Jerry Patients, and also uh, the one on Nice um, Tech and the Hospital Time. Um, but I want to move in that direction um, partly through um, Charlotte Delvaux's Auschwitz and After. If, if you're short of time, if you're reading that book, read. It's a three-volume work, actually, published in France in three separate volumes. Uh, so that's what makes it legitimate to cut corners of it here. Read the first volume and the last volume, uh, in, if you are short of time. You can only manage two-thirds of the, of the reading. Um, but I want to do that, and then, in a rather bitty way, I want to turn to Haydn's um, um, Farewell Symphony, which crops up fairly frequently in age writing as a metaphor for the epidemic. And uh, I want to sort of move between those two uh, texts to try and develop an idea um, about what haunting might be thought to be all about. Nothing better to do with yourself. Go and listen to the February symphony. Uh, we know there's a little anecdote attached to it, you probably know about all these colleges do read the score. <laughs> yeah, Edmund White's novel, yes. uh, perhaps central for the uh, yes. Grand yes, and the other one is Lovie uh, Guibert's uh, Alami qui m'a pas sauvé la vie, neither of which we will read in, uh, in class. Both of them uh, have used quite specifically to the uh, and, and, uh, There's a symphony. I'm trying to get a symphony that involves as well as a, a disappearing actor. He's also a disappearing actor. So um, reduced you very satisfactorily to a numbed silence. <laughs> Good. Ross, to go back to that sentence. Mm-hmm. 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 And, and then when you uh, when you're writing the slide of this uh, moment where space is shown, mm-hmm. uh, so it seems that there is a relation there between body and text, and the space yeah. is in the book, yeah. but it knows that the, the others yeah. cannot really read for it. Yeah. And so he is, uh, so there is a kind of hierarchy of readers, I mean, the, the, the other passenger cannot read. Mm-hmm. That Nicole will be a favorite 
mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, self who will be at the at the top of the hierarchy and read all these things. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, welcome to the seminar. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, there's a kind of an effect of, con of accumulation and a hierarchical movement from the gold through smart to the very hypothetical uh, reader who's capable of doing everything that the capable of doing, everything that smart is capable of doing, and then everything that a good reader can can do on top. Yeah. And also, it reminds me of what Bart is saying, uh, Sarrazin, about the frustration of the pandemic. And there is here yeah, a kind of pandemic uh, mm. experience in terms of reading yeah. the sickness is dissemination. I'm sorry to say, yes. Different ways, yeah. different kind of media. Yeah. He was uh, working, obviously, in the cult I know we're past time, uh, in the cultural context of the France of the late 80s and uh, early 90s, which was in a stage of denial what you referred to as de-dramatization. You remember that stuff? Uh, when the governmental attitude to the age epidemic was, let's not scare the horses, right? Uh, De-dramatization. Let's pretend it's not there and you know, let the medical folks look after it. Maybe we won't make any particular effort in the direction of education, in the direction of distributing condoms, in the direction of trying to reach communities at risk or any of that kind of thing with the result that France turns out now to have a population roughly like that of uh, the United Kingdom has three times the case of AIDS for the United Kingdom. And that's the kind of attitude we don't assume that essentially the three major French writers, Elie Guibert, Pascal Dudu, and Chilly Collard, each in their own way, are trying to turn into a dramatization. It, the, the, it looks like a lot of best breastfeeding to us, right? When we, when we read it as good, you know, four feet on the ground Anglo-Saxons, uh, as I'm going to claim to be for this purpose, you know. It looks like over-dramatization, but it's in response to this business of dampening it all down and pretending it's not there, going on with life as if there was, if there was no problem. Uh, and so that's why you get some of the rhetorical excess that, uh, that there is uh, here. And it worked. In all of those three cases it worked. But the, the, the three texts in question, to the friend who do not say my life, Kavali and um, Savage Nights, became as overnight publishing successes. Right? The result that their authors' uh, estates are doing very nicely. Um, thank you, you know, it's ironic, but they did put the issue of AIDS on the map through their own in a way that again is unimaginable in the anger kind of um, We must stop. I didn't. It's been great to find Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, well, we can keep going. This is wonderful. <laughs> Why did I, I must have misread my watch, and, and you people very cannily didn't correct me for that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, well, um, either that or we can take a half uh, 20 minutes off. Um, but this is really an opportunity to catch up on some of the discussions we have. Does anyone have a big question that they've been holding back? A small question? Well, yeah, go uh, well, is planning a matter of making of a, 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 a folk or technical language, or is it a matter of showing? Yeah. Or is this language already mm -hmm. zero positive? Yeah, you, that's a better way of formulating it. You're right. Yeah. Which is better? Uh, showing, <laughs> showing the language to be already oh, okay. in the text. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, see, the, um, those. Um, there's a passage, let me see if I can find the page number here, that I skipped over because I was going so fast in the belief that, that um, an hour had disappeared from my life without my being aware of it. Uh, uh, in which um, the, the distinguishes between two kinds of writing. 
talks about écrivanité. Uh, this is all based on the form écrivain, obviously, right? It talks about écrivanité, which is writers who are um, not particularly conscious uh, of what he calls the ultimate blank page uh, that awaits their text, right? And that awaits them uh, as well. Um, and consequently, he says, they don't tend to the imperfections in their writing. Uh, this is on page 52. Uh, tout ce qui manque, tout ce qu'il y a en trop, tout ce qui est mal fait. So, every, you know, what's missing, uh, what's supernumerary, and also what's botched in the, in the writing, okay? So there's an assumption there that writing is always imperfect. Uh, and that attention to, imp to the imperfections of writing is the sign of uh, what he calls the écrivain, right? Who is not vain uh, in the same way, anyway. The écrivain is a writer, is a writer person, uh, somebody who is writing. Um, whose text is uh, marked by uh, the consciousness of death uh, in the sense that it is aware of its imperfections, uh, that it is turning those imperfections into writing. Okay. Um, now, tout ce qui manque, tout ce qu'il y a en trop, in particular, tout ce qu'il y a en trop is not a bad way of understanding the way the meanings of language will proliferate if you start to look at its uh, signifier, uh, at the signifiers of language uh, in the way that a punster tends to, tends to do, right? There is a kind of surplus of meaning in language that goes beyond uh, the simple communication of, of utilitarian ideas uh, in the way that uh, people describe, I think falsely, but in the way that people falsely describe the everyday uh, communication. Um, situations and so one of the things that punning does is exploiting that surplus uh, that's in language, making it mean, making it uh, making it meaningful, but also making it the sign of of there being an entre, which is uh, the, the evidence that death is at work in the text in a way that uh, the virus is entre in the body and at work in the body, and, and making the virus also the site of la mort on earth. L'œuvre en création de la mort, as he, as he puts it. Um, now all that's extrapolation on my part. It's not the way it laid out in the, in the text at all, right? So you need to be suspicious of it. Uh, but I think you can hang it on to enough. Uh, you know, he does a little bit of self-reflexive theory in passing as he goes. After a couple of days, he gets quite interested in the theory of writing. I think you can. You know, hang that kind of an understanding onto that. What do you think? Does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I think it's a really interesting way to, to understand the question. I think there's a writing that is, that's for the cows in the field, right, chewing their cuds and wondering whether to pay corn or pay pet, you know, uh, or not wondering whether to pay corn or pay pet, just going ahead and chewing. Um, there's that kind of writing, and then there's another kind of uh, writing. He says that in another place, so I never reread myself. Let there be contradictions. If there are contradictions, so much the better. Uh, if, if you're looking in following up on a comment of uh, Roland's, uh, understanding um, that writing in all of these texts, but most literally in this one, tends to be uh, writing with the body. Uh, writing with the AIDS body, uh, then what we have here is a, a rather um, intellectually satisfying definition of what writing with the AIDS body, um, what, what one might understand by that, by that term, right? right? Or what I call the writing of AIDS, um, with a little equivocation of my own there as to whether it's a subjective genitive or an objective genitive. Is AIDS doing the writing? Or am I doing the writing on behalf of AIDS? For thinking about those kinds of issues. No, I don't think there was anything, <laughs> in retrospect, uh, nothing really important that I left out in my helter skelter. It's
skipping of pages here. Um, oh, the other uh, quotation to throw in in response to that is uh, the, the series of puns on page 64 about uh, infirmity and infimity. Inferme devant la mort, je la sais toute proche. Okay. Um, I guess uh, infirme is, uh, is a hypothetical pun, which is not present in the text, but that's what infirme devant la mort means, right? It means being infirm. And then towards the bottom of the page, ceci est un journal infime, avec beaucoup d'espace blanc, où se loge invisible, l'invisible. Blank page is the place where the unsayable is invisibly present. You probably couldn't get a clearer quotation than that to indicate what the readers, what's expected of the reader um, here, but also what the understanding of, of, the, of the textual imperfection is. Uh, it's our theme in the sense of just not being up to the task, not being adequate to its task. It's full of blanks where it should have. One might think that it should have uh, um, a presence that has absence. Oh. Is that so? Thank you. I never noticed that. Yeah. Terrific. What it is to have a good education. <laughs> 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 I just reread it. Day before yesterday, I didn't notice that. Yeah. I was thinking about the idea of writing from from the extremities of the idea of the virus. There's so many levels of a, a virus language. Uh, is uh, is it being the secret virus of, uh, aboard the ship? Um, that uh, and there seems to be the sense of, of, of addressing, uh, I mean, both are, both are addressing AIDS, but just addressing like, the, the literal content of, uh, uh, of existence. That um, yeah. you know, somehow through 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 acknowledgement, through uh, I guess even being willing to to try to achieve something beautiful uh, out of something so so ugly. Um, that, that it does open up the possibilities of, of suffering both the sublime, but realizing that that is at the price of, of, of basically ugly. And if he's addressing like the hypothetical reader and, and trying to break this indifference that, that he um, represents, and he is sort of offering a possibility of of experiencing something more, uh, but you know, at at the price of of, of, of the cost of having to. Realize that you also have to face what what is that? And the only sort of the only way out of being the cow is you know, and then mm -hmm. just choosing to graze yeah. or not to graze. Yeah, that's right. uh, Is to is to look at the ugly as well. That's uh, right. as, as well as look, look at the sublime. Yeah. And that the only route to perhaps you know, like I mean, in one sense, it is this sort of uh, uh, idealization of of this uh, same being at the threshold of death and of all everything looks different experience at the point each day is is a new a, a new experience but there's also that, that sense that this is only possible through there's almost a sense it's only possible through the virus the existence of the virus so that um, yeah through the existence of what I call viral phenomena mm -hmm. um, there's another passage quite early um, from the first day at sea um, when the captain is having drinks before dinner for the passengers and they're standing on the, uh, the upper deck of the cargo ship looking down uh, onto the metal of the lower deck of the next deck down and uh, the dude sees the patterns of rust and metal um, and he's struck by them and he points out that the patterns of rust individualize the ship in the way that they individualize it. Because patterns are unique to the, to the ship. 
And then he goes on to say that everybody else is really So he, uh, he's suggesting that this is a this is a world view, if you like, rather than it's just something that exists. If you think carefully about the some of the consequences of the age of theory, uh, and just stick to the medical uh, consequences, it's perfectly clear that if age can happen uh, through the transfer of a virus uh, from an animal population to the human population, then a lot of other horrible things can happen too, and that they will be horrible to humans because humans, uh, humans are not adapted uh, to the most likely uh, story about the origin of age is that the virus or, some, or a very close uh, family member of the same family of viruses has been um, a parasite in certain kinds of apes and monkeys for many, many, many centuries. Um, these being African. Um, but something that happened in a lab was that they caged um, African monkeys with uh, Asian monkeys. And the Asian monkeys fell ill with an AIDS like disease, which suggested that the Asian monkeys did not have protection uh, from the virus in the way that the African monkeys did. And therefore, that uh, human AIDS, which in some of its strands looks like a very close relation to the simian. Uh, is as, vir as virulent as it is simply because we haven't spent centuries getting uh, and, uh, again. Uh, of all the animals that we cohabit with, increasingly close contact in some parts of the world. Three viruses, uh, P2, you know, uh, etc., etc., et carry viruses to which human beings are probably uh, horribly, horribly um, uh, vulnerable. Nobody is doing any work on it. And you're going to piece me away when chicken flu turns out and they try to do something by killing the chickens, right? But nobody is working on, on some of the implications. Right? So, so one can look at the world as being, if you can take a virus idea of the world, as being a place where there are all kinds of hosts and once in a while you swap hosts to see what it's like in the other host. And, um, and if you don't kill off too many of your hosts, then chances are you will eventually uh, find a permanent home in that, in that host as well as in your original one. Uh, from the point of view of a virus. Um, so, yeah, there's some sense of that um, here. I think some understanding of the world as a, a place of great unconsciousness on the part of the conscious inhabitants of it, uh, who are simply unaware of their own vulnerability, but also, as you say, unaware of the consequences of that. Uh, had I known I was going to have all this spare time, I'd have done you a little part of history of, uh, of the um, aesthetics of the sublime, uh, and tried to sell you on the idea that that in doing the aesthetics of the, you know, Longinus, I'll do it for you, Longinus, but can't, there you go. Uh, in th that the, you know, rather uh, rich uh, history that we have of thinking about the sublime has displaced and in many ways replaced, substituted for a history of the obscene, which hasn't been done. Uh, and that's a reason why the resources of sublimity are so available to a writer like uh, Pascal de Duve, who went to school and read his book there, uh, there and um, read his Nietzsche, and everything that he's read and has gone into here, while the resources of the obscene are not available to us. Uh, we don't have that language because it hasn't been developed. Why hasn't it been developed? Nobody wants to hear about it. And I would, I'm guessing now that if you looked at the theory of the sublime, you can see that it is in disguised form a theory of uh, pain, and not in very disguised, right? Theory of pain and a theory of trauma. Right. Well, Bert actually, uh, one of the 
qualities that is that is part of this about Brian is that it is, you know, it is something that is terrifying. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact referred yeah. to it, but like he described yeah. it, well, you know, if you're looking, if you're standing at the edge of an abyss, uh, what makes the experience so sublime is, is the fact that there's also fear and terror, yes. shaking, quivering, yeah. uh, uh, involved in that. So, I mean, I can see this. Mm -hmm. okay, it's I mean, there's the part where I just mentioned that, well, AIDS is the, you know, the best uh, uh, example of, you know, the, the physical and concrete expression of Gibraltar's and Tanitha. Yeah, the death drive and the, yeah. the cut too. Yeah, that's all, all in one, you know, and of course that can be given that sort of a pun and that will give you AIDS is associated, that's associated with, with love. Yeah. Directly through, through the act of doing that, killing yourself through. Right. Through the, through the yeah, it's another version of the same uh, syndrome. Um, I think I mentioned this before, you might want to look at um, the Yotar's book, uh, Lina. Um, where his way of talking about the sublime is to describe it as being the aesthetic problem of the sublime is the problem of the presentation of the unpresentable. And uh, of course, you know, that is exactly the problem that we've seen too. And those cows in the field are as unconcerned about the sublime as they are unconcerned about the scene. It's the same category from the point of view of the cows. Yeah. So that's the Translation, I want to. I'm really sorry I screwed up on the, on the time thing. Uh, I'll try to, be, uh, try to be better in the future. <laughs> I'm not panic here, uh, but I guess we've gone through it anyway.